this morning we're talking about fundraising, how to deploy capital in the cannabis industry. Uh, today, I'm pleased to introduce Emily Paxia, Managing Partner of Poseidon Asset Management. Emily uh, has been researching and investing with her business partner and brother Morgan in the cannabis industry since 2013. They manage two active funds in the sector and multiple SPVs. Emily spends her time diligencing investment opportunities across the US, Latin America, Europe, and working with existing portfolio companies. She has served on the board of the MPP, Athletes for Care and the Initiative, and she loves dedicating time to working with female founders to foster balance in the industry. Welcome, Emily. Next, we have Krishnan Verrier, the managing partner for Arcadian Capital. Krishnan is the head of Arcadian's investment management business and oversees the firm's capital allocation strategy, deal execution, and portfolio monitoring activities. Before joining Arcadian in 2018 to help launch its first fund, he worked uh, in cannabis startups as a consultant, assisting with capital raising and investment underwriting. Krishnan was previously an investment banker, primarily covering companies in the healthcare industry with posts held at Cohen, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Morgan Keegan. He was also a senior investment analyst for Well Tower REIT, a global leader in the healthcare real estate industry. Krishnan received his bachelor's in economics from the University of Texas at Austin and has an MBA from the University of North Carolina. Welcome, Krishnan. Next, we have Heather Quinn Malloy, the owner of Ulu Capital and Consulting. Heather has been an active investor and consultant in the cannabis industry since 2015, most recently working with Tara Ascend, where she was chief strategy officer and executive vice president of corporate development, leading the review of over 200 companies, closing in excess of $300 million of US-based acquisitions and closed over 100 million in capital. Heather has also consulted with and served as a board member with numerous early stage companies and helped close in excess of $15 million in seed capital for companies like women-led Jane West, winning disp dispensary applicants in and Sunday Good, the pharmacy. Heather has also made a numerous, a number of personal and angel investments in the space with companies such as Eboo, Meadow, and Thrive Agritech. Thank you, Heather, for your support, and thank you for joining us this morning. Whew. All right, we got two more. Dai Trong, the VP of Corporate Development at Left Coast Ventures. Uh, Dai has more than 10 years of M&A and venture capital experience. He currently leads business development, investments, and M&A as VP Corporate Development at Left Coast Ventures. Dai's main focus at LCB is to help the company expand into delivery and retail and invest, acquire, and scale brands. Prior to LCV, he held a similar position at MedMen as VP of Corporate Development. Previously, he held similar roles with Anheuser-Busch, Austin Ventures, and Bank of America. Finally, this conversation will be moderated by Matt Burns, the managing editor of TechCrunch. He has been at the outlet for more than 12 years where he's part of the core leadership team running editorial content and events such as TechCrunch Disrupt, where our fellow cannabis friends, Canix, recently took home the prize. Go friends, go Canix, good work, Stacy. Uh, Matt recently started covering cannabis, everything from startups with no novel solutions to mass industry trends. Along with cannabis, he covers automotive and hardware startups. He works from Michigan and has two plants, Wolverine and Sparty. Maybe he can tell us more about those. So welcome everyone. Um, Matt, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks for being here. Hey, how are you doing? Thanks for having us. This is, this, is, this is a great time. And I love that we get the best spot of the entire show at 10 a.m. on Saturday morning. So I, I appreciate that. But you did a great intro, so I do not have to do that. So let's just dive right in. Um, the conversation today is going to be based around three topics. Number one, we're going to talk about opportunities for startups and, and where startups can make money right now. Then we're going to talk about fundraising challenges because it is still an illicit activity in a lot of states and a lot of areas. And then we're going to go into the general state of cannabis and where more opportunities lie for startups. So let's just dive right in. Um, Dai, let's, let's start with you. What type of solution should startups be, be building right now? Wow, no softball question to start, huh? Nope. Let's just go. 10 a.m. Yes, Saturday no, I'll, morning. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, you know, for, for us, 
given that we operate everything, you know, when we started this from incubation to investment to acquisitions and something that I've dealt with a lot this summer and, and couldn't find a solution for, and someone should build it or build a better one, um, it would be for a flower sourcing marketplace. So Confident sort of started with the lab testing. They're connected to all the cultivators. Um, but I had a lot of fun this summer, like trying to help out with, with our company. You know, it should be as simple as, hey, we have this much money to spend. Here's how much we want to spend it. Here is, you know, the THC percentages for our products. Here are our brands. Um, who's selling it to us and, and how much do you have? And let's set up a way for us over video at first because of COVID to you know, review things and then send our, our head of operations out. So for me, whoever's building that would, would be like the ultimate solution that would really help the industry today. What, I mean, let's go a little deeper. What would the ultimate solution work like? How would it work? I mean, just a wholesale marketplace, right? So there are marketplaces like LeafLink, but they're not really focused on wholesale. You know, I've talked to those guys um, at LeafLink. I've talked to people at Weed Maps, talked to a lot of folks, but it just seems like there's not really a good solution at the wholesale flower bot today. Because, you know, a lot of it's still very relationship-based. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there are people who grow indexes of hundreds of people that they can call on. There are people who are, are growing and, you know, there's, there's one or two people they'll call that will require a lot. So just having a real marketplace where there's demand already, but there's not supply and consistent supply today. Yeah, that's interesting. Emily, what about you? What do you see as an opportunity right now? Ooh, I'm going to lob a hot one in. Um, you know, one of the things that's top of mind for me right now, being in the Bay Area and working with a lot of uh, cultivators and uh, across the entire supply chain in California is the, the fires. And it's not just the fires, but it's mm. the smoke and the impact that those different factors can have right now in a very critical time in the cultivation cycle. So I'm thinking about I don't know, I'm gonna put this one out there. What about a technology that helps to remediate crops or a flower that's been potentially contaminated with smoke? Something, I mean, I know the farmers have different strategies right now that they're using, but I'm just thinking about something maybe after harvest that could be an interesting way to preserve or protect the flower from issues around that. Oh yeah, that's interesting. Have you, have you ran into any issues right now with the cultivators? Is this something they're facing dramatically? <sighs> Yeah, I mean, it will be. I'm not sure, you know, we'll have to see what happens because it all has to do with the heavy metals that come down from the, the ash or the smoke. Um, mm -hmm. In the first fires, it was very much burning organic matter because it was largely in the parks, which is sad, um, and in the forests. But um, recently, the ones in Napa and Sonoma are now burning structures and probably burning vehicles and probably burning fuel. So there's, there's a lot of other things. We saw this in previous years when it was burning more um, local areas where people were living and working. So um, there are d different challenges with that. I'm not sure what the fallout is yet because it really does matter. There are so many factors that determine whether or not it will impact a crop, but also just living near wine country and hearing what the, the winery and the, the vineyards are going through is, it's an analog to track. And so it's just something I'm thinking about as we continue to, whether or not we want to admit that climate change is happening um, California and Oregon have been on fire for mid-August period going, cycling through. And so it's something I think we have to think about how we can protect our, our crops of all kinds. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think this is a, a broader topic I did not anticipate, but has this, <laughs> has the fires changed your investment strategy in California cannabis uh, cultivation? No, I mean, the, the one thing I am thinking about with our operators is thinking about diversifying maybe the regions where they are cultivating so that all your your flower isn't one in one basket so to speak maybe there's something to that um but that's just i mean really we're we're going to do a serious debrief after the season ends because we just want our operators to be able to get through this time and get through it safely most importantly but um once we get through this time and see what happens next i think that it's something that we're going to have to think about we've been so so leaning into California since the inception of our firm. Um, and I still mm -hmm. consider it to be one of the most beautiful and wonderful places, not only in the world to live, but to, yeah, who, uh, to navigate, to really cultivate and nurture a, a true legacy industry. Um, so I, I'm loath to think about leaning or kind of stepping out of it. I want, in, for, in fact, for, I want to lean further into it to figure out how to protect it. Guys, yeah. before, sorry, before we go on, we're hearing a little beeping and I'm just wondering if we can identify where it's coming from so it doesn't keep going. It's kind of every 10 seconds. Emily, can you Oh, I do hear second? that. 
It's not me. I don't think. Is it I me? Do. Let, let's try. Matt, I think it might be coming from you. Sorry to interrupt your conversation. I just think okay. it'll be better for everyone how, to listen to. How about now? Is it gone now? Yeah, I think so. Better. Well, for my everyone. audio might be a little less. I, I, I switched to AirPods. So. Okay, perfect. Right awesome. Much better. Thanks, guys. Keep going. You're doing that. great. No, no, no. Great. Um, so, Krishna and, and Heather, I want to go to you on this. With, with the fires in California, is that changing your approach to California investing? Well, I'll, I'll lead off. Um, and I would say that for us, the answer is no. Uh, and the reason is because we're not, we don't invest in, um, in direct cannabis operators. Mm -hmm. We are, uh, we're, we're strictly investing in non-plant touching ancillary businesses. So as a result, um, we are, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a couple of degrees of separation between, um, Sure. Between what's, uh, you know, what's happening with cultivators and the fires. Now that said, you know, at some point it, it does impact uh, the companies that we're in, investing in, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't change, uh, it, you know, the investment criteria. We're not investing specifically in California or in any other state. The companies that we are investing in generally uh, we're investing because they have the ability to operate across the United States. So basically, it was a bad question to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Heather? Is it a bad question to ask you as well? Oh, Heather, you're muted. Sorry, user error. Um, I um I haven't really been focused on California for quite a while. Uh, most recently, I was more focused on the East Coast. So I don't know specifically. Like I'm not as intimate as you know Emily with the sure. the market dynamics. Um, if you want me to talk well, about the original, yeah, let's go back to the original question. So what what kind of opportunities do you see right now? Well, so I guess I have a different lens potentially because I haven't been as sitting as um as deeply inside an operating company as of late. And so the things that I've been really fixated on have been um, with respect to getting data in markets that I want to look mm. at in terms of making reliable decisions and having it be accessible to investors. So I feel like there's a really disparate uh, number of investors looking at the space that aren't necessarily cannabis experts, but they want to have good data. Absolutely. And I think getting data right now is a pretty significant challenge. Some of the stuff I'm looking at right now, I'm actually going and publicly scraping press releases and trying to build my own data set. And so I think that I would like to see less expensive, better access to market data to help inform customers because I feel like there's really disparate, unbalanced sharing of information, which makes it really, mm -hmm. really difficult for um, some investors to get comfortable with the space. And then the other thing that is still, I mean, I'm hoping that this is improving, but the inability of people to actually make clean wires and payments in terms of getting money into the system. And so that's like a solution that's not necessarily sexy. Um, and I think some people have been working on it, but I still have, like, I've seen this come up time and time and time again with companies that are either looking for investment or loan or any form of capital. And I, I think everybody as operators knows that it can be a really constraining issue for your business. So it's not yeah, sexy, absolutely. but like data and banking, I think are still unfortunately kind of top of mind for me with, with respect to things that would, uh, could use improvement. Yeah, no, I agree with you on the data. I, I do a lot of reporting on this, and it is hard to find reliable data. And I've found that the companies that went public in Canada, uh, they seem to be, they have to be more transparent than startups. And so for me, that's helped a lot. Um, and then for the, the second point with with uh, with getting money into the system, it's not sexy, but money's kind of sexy. And that's, that's a big, big <laughs> opportunity for a lot of startups. Yeah. Yeah, great. So Krishna, let's go back to you with the original original question what do you where do you see opportunities right now yeah i i think that right now the opportunity um is uh, is largely in being able to bring together um various fragmented areas of the industry whether you know for us a lot of the the fragmentation is going to be that there's you know that there is a number of disparate um uh tech solutions that 
particularly a, a vertically integrated operator has to employ in order to be able to, um, uh, you know, to be able to manage their business. There's no, uh, you know, I think that it, there's still not a real end-to-end solution um, for for most of the company's needs, um, right. and and so I think this opens up the door for uh, you know value-added resellers to come in and be able to package some of these things, some of these solutions together, um, and and provide a, a customized best-in-breed solution on an operator by operator basis without actually having to bring companies together. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about your most recent in, in investments. Where where are you investing right now, Krishna? Yeah, so our focus right now is anything that um, that helps brands and retailers um, develop deeper relationships with their customers, um, mm-hmm. and 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 so that can be approached in a number of different ways. Um, you know, one of the companies that we recently invested in this year uh, and added to our portfolio is Philo. Um, and uh, they are, uh, you know, they're, they're a marketing technology company that is uh, that that works with a lot of the multi-state operators in um, in helping to uh, create, you know, compliant content for um, for for brands to be able to uh, to reach out and speak to uh, their customers. Yeah, let, let's stay with you for one more question. When you're Sure. When you see startups fundraising, what what type of mistakes are they making right now? Oh, uh, right now, you know, I, I will. This is what one thing that I, I've noticed over the last uh, year is that there's been a dramatic shift in the quality of deals that we're you know we're seeing. Um, mm-hmm. And whereas I would say like a a year and a half ago, our, our biggest problem was you know, weeding through the noise, um, and, and, you know, trying to figure out, you know, which companies or or which teams really are in the best position to be able to uh, address the problems that they've sought out to address. And, and now, uh, and, and there was, you know, there was less ability to see, um, how that would be executed. Um, and, and I think now what we're seeing is that there's just a much higher quality, uh, of, of deals and companies that are looking for capital right now. So the problem of, of allocating capital to these companies gets to be a lot more fun as a result. Yeah, yeah, I, I've seen that as well. And that's one of the reasons TechCrunch is, uh, is more interested in cannabis now than we have in the past because a bunch of venture capitalists are looking at a lot of incumbent people Absolutely. that have Look, been around and, and, for a while. And, and I think that what, what we're seeing now is that uh, this industry is driving innovation that really can impact, um, uh, you know, retail in all kinds of other sectors as well, traditional retail, including, you know, um, department stores or, or mm-hmm. specialty retail stores that, um, you know, may not have necessarily had the resources or time to, to develop these, um, you know, develop these solutions, but because of the highly regulated environments and hyper-localized environments that cannabis operates in, um, you know, there, there have to people have to be creative and, and innovative in, in how they're, um, you know, how they're trying to gain market share. So um, a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of these uh, technologies and ideas can be applied to traditional retail. And, and so, you know, when we're looking at, uh, you know, companies uh, at this time, we're, you know, we're looking for companies that are uh, addressing an immediate um, you know, unmet need in the cannabis industry, but also have applications outside the industry um, that you know will help uh, you know de-risk the investment and um, and increase its addressable market. Mm-hmm. You know, this is actually one of the uh, the most most exciting spots in retail is cannabis. Retail everywhere else is is, is dying. Heather, what are you seeing? Well, I, so I've been on a little bit of a hiatus, so I haven't been looking really, really actively at, uh, at, at much. I've been mostly looking right now at, um, effectively like real estate investments that are, you know, tied to the, to the plant. Cause I think some of the more traditional investors that I am working with like the asset play. So they're more interested mm-hmm. in looking at this from a real estate perspective. Um, and then, um, 
Well, that's interesting yeah, and- what you said, but the investors you work with, are you talking about your LP? No. So I have, I, so I left Terrasen probably, I don't know, two, eight, eight weeks ago. And oh, um, I great. have, so I've been kind of sitting on the sidelines. I have a non-compete and uh, I have to take some time off, but I have some investors that uh, I speak with right now. So I'm kind of looking at some deal related stuff for certain investors. Um, and a lot of what I'm looking at is real estate related. Why do they like the real estate? Um, well, I think because they feel like it's something that they understand better than um, potentially the market and cannabis right now for in a lot of these limited license markets is hyper local. And so mm-hmm. if they feel like they are a real estate investor that's used to investing in another style of real estate, it's easy to kind of get your head around um, a local market and understand the, the metrics in that local market and kind of come up with some estimate of, of how that asset will perform over time. Um, so I think it's really about like people's risk threshold and then not necessarily understanding how to value a lot of these cannabis companies. Because when you think about the right now, all of these just for hyper local markets, and I know California is different, like California is in and of itself, like a ginormous marketplace. Uh, But there are a lot of other markets out there that are super hyper local and not understanding what the regulatory shift could be over time in terms of. So unlike Krishnan looking at things that apply everywhere all the time, um, there's so many investment opportunities in localized markets that that are really, really reliant on the regulatory boundaries that are set in those markets. And so that's like a a very different risk profile to understand and analyze. So when people look at a hard asset where they feel like they have some downside protection. um, So that's mostly what I've been looking at. Uh, I'd like to get back into more deal flow for sure. But uh, I've been a little bit removed from my computer for a while, which has also been really great for me. (laughs) Yeah, that's great. And I apologize for the train noise in the background. I live in the middle of Michigan and uh, the train from Chicago to Flint. And it goes by my house a couple, couple times a day. It just happens to be right now. So the, right. the deal flow, the deal flow is, is interesting because there seems to be an increase, as we were talking about just a minute ago, of higher quality startups that are addressing cannabis needs. So I, I asked Dai, what what are you looking at right now? Yeah, we're we're very focused on delivery and retail. I would say, you know, with COVID, that's sort of flipped. Before I thought it was probably mm-hmm. 60, 40 retail first, um, you know, also coming from MedMen and also thinking where consumer education happens in the space today. But I think now that we've seen more and more delivery options um, and people looking to sell or if you're raising money, that the unit economics are great. I think there's still, you know, some tech infrastructure there with the integration between sort of your delivery system, um, your POS, and then any logistics and routing. I think Metal has a pretty good solution that I saw um, you know, some folks use, but there's still a lot of integration that needs to happen between these disparate systems. Um, but we certainly look at delivery a ton. Um, and then kind of what I mentioned earlier with solutions that solve these pain points, which are very meaningful. I mean, yesterday, and going to what you're saying to your point about more folks entering the space that have call it VC backable companies. I was speaking with someone who, you know, 20 plus years of product management at a tech company who is now sort of building a marketplace um, based on sort of genetics, right? So there's like over 2000 um, in that catalog and then he's just made a better UI for, for folks to search. So I think more and more of these iterations coming in, I think at the same time, you sort of need a Canvas partner, right? So, so that person, um, his family has been in Canvas for 20 plus years. So while he's been in tech, so that connection makes a lot of sense. So we're, I mean, you do have a lot of Silicon Valley uh, veterans joining the ranks of cannabis companies, right? But where does that leave the enthusiast that's been in this market for a long time, a lifelong love, and they want to get involved? How do they compete against former Google employees or Apple employees? I don't think it's competing against them. I, I think you you need that sort of background. So I think it's partnering with them, right? So if, if you have 20 plus years of Canvas experience, you go and find that partner that has 20 plus years at early stage startup. And I think that blend um, from an investor's perspective is usually what we like to see. Um, you know, obviously Mad Men n- no longer sort of in that category, but they did a good job of having all these legacy players, but then going out and recruiting these Fortune 500 folks to bring in at the C-level and the mid-level. Sure. You know, in the startup world, we, we talk a lot about finding your technical founder. You might have the idea, but you need somebody to actually build it. 
So is there a place here? I'm, I'm kind of thinking out of the box here. Is, is there a, a chief weed officer? Is that going to be a thing? You might have somebody that knows how to found a company, but you might not know the, uh, the, the economy as it were. Uh, it, it seems like chief strategy officer or, or head of BD is, is uh, that title at some of these cannabis companies that I've seen. Right, right. Yeah, that makes that, I guess that's more technical. <laughs> so, <laughs> Emily, what are your thoughts on this? Um, you know, I mean, we're, we continue to focus on the tech piece as well as across the entire supply chain. Um, when we've been investing in international opportunities, we've been focused more on kind of the purely medical kind of GMP certified operators because it's an interesting um, requirement that some of the markets have, such as like, for example, Germany, in order to distribute into that market, you have to have um, established a GMP supply chain. And so that's, that's some of the things we're thinking about when we're looking at opportunities right now and continuing to focus on that international piece as well as really, as I mentioned, leaning in in California. And so right now we are talking with um, additional tech uh, resources that are trying to solve, to Heather's point, the payment and banking piece. It's been kind of the ongoing challenge of the industry. And, and we saw it a lot during um, COVID, especially when other operators in other markets were able to just rely on digital payments. So you didn't have to right. touch things. Now we're still doing that. And not to mention the fact that we're, you know, still warehousing a lot of cash mm -hmm. in this industry. So, so the banking piece, um, I agree with Krishnan in terms of there's excellent tech solutions, but being able to tie this all together and thinking about how to make the operator's job a more seamless um, activity. But you know, one of the things we're working on now a lot um, to tie back to your other questions about fundraising and about attracting traditional kind of Silicon Valley or tech VC money. Um, I will note that uh, several of our portfolio companies already have very traditional tech funds in them. And I mean, including Meadow who, you know, came through Y Combinator, Com Confident, sure. Confident Cannabis coming through Y Combinator. I think that it's been a little bit quiet as the VC community gets more comfortable with the sector and really understands what the growth trajectory is looking like, really understands how it's becoming quite destigmatized. Um, but one of the things I'm noticing with our particular companies is they're coming up to their Series B round of fundraising. And we're really trying to prepare the founders for trying to engage with that more traditional tech community of investors early in the process. So really getting them into the business, getting them to understand what their solution is all about, what the growth trajectory of the industry is about, what the industry itself is about. Mm -hmm. Because the thing I'm a bit concerned about is that series seed round of fundraising is a certain kind of time frame to ramp the investor up and get the lead in and then close the round. Series A gets a little bit longer. The diligence process is more intense. There's a lot more to dig through at that point. And then Series B is quite an intense process. And so this is where we are in the lifetime of our industry. It's since we've been investing industry in the legal and regulated markets, um, was we, we opened our fund right alongside Colorado going adult use legal. So I feel like our investments in the industry have grown along the maturation curve as well as the industry. And so now that's one of the things we're working on is like, you're looking at six, eight months before your series B fundraise, you want to start engaging that community so they can really understand the bigger macro aspects of it. And then they can really dive into your business. And so that's, that's one of the things we're really working with our founders on. Let's, uh, let's talk about these firms, you, the tech firms that you want um, mm -hmm. some of the startups to engage with, just in case some of the audience members aren't, are unaware. Who, who are they and what do they normally uh, invest in? Well, so, okay, so I should character uh, call out a special nuance around attracting capital. It, it also depends on their LP agreements and whether or not they, they have a carve out where they can invest sure. into cannabis because cannabis does get designated by some groups is still kind of being a sin industry uh, because of the federal um, status of the of the plant. Um, so there's like, who would you love to go after? I mean, we'd love to see, you know, attracting capital from, you know, Sequoia or any number of, you know, household names, right, of course. investment groups, but it all comes down to their ability because I know that that is another reason you have to back time the process is because sometimes they'll get pretty far down the path and then it just won't get through the committee in terms of approving it as an investment 
sector, I should say. So that's happened quite a few times with our companies, whether or not the partners want to do it themselves. And and a lot of times we've seen actually the partners invest their own capital into the industry right. when it won't make it through that um, path. So it's hard for me to say because I'd love to list off any number of, of firms, but then I don't know what their limitations are yet around what their partnership agreements dictate. Yeah, one more question on this though, right? So what needs to change for startups to be able to access the major cash that like Andreessen Horowitz or Sequoia or any of these other yeah. major tech, tech, what needs to change for that to happen? Yeah, well, I've seen some tech groups, um, oh, who did I see? I've seen some tech uh, investors in their newest funds that they've just raised have a carve out where they're allowed to focus a little bit more into this industry. Uh, Lair Hippo, I believe is one out of mm -hmm. New York that has created, and they've invested into the industry for years. Yep. Um, but I think that that's one thing that could change. I think that maybe safe banking could help because that may change some regulations around the designation of cash and the way that it's managed. And especially if we get capital markets, as a part of that, I think that would unlock a lot. Um, it would certainly unlock a lot on the banking side. And that's an area that we're, as um, the other panelists mentioned, we're sorely lacking. But I think that could also unlock venture capital as well. Yeah, Krishna, let's go to you on this. What are you seeing here? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Uh, it's in terms of, uh, of what needs you know, what is it? Yeah, is what, what needs to change in, in order for the general investing community to invest in cannabis startups? Federal legalization. I mean, yeah. So what, what, what is that going to happen? Oh, uh, I mean, I, I think we can all stipulate based on, you know, what's going out there. I think that, um, I think it's going to not happen all at once. I think it's going to happen in, 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 bits and pieces of regulation, um, such as the MORE Act and, and Save Act. But, um, you know, I think that the biggest catalyst for all of it is going to be um, <clears throat> whether or not cannabis gets descheduled as, uh, you know, from Schedule 1. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, I, I think that there is going to be some incremental interest if it gets rescheduled. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it's going to take a full deschedule for uh, for most institutional investors to yeah. um, to feel confident to come in right now. Emily's nodding long, so I assume she agrees. But she also brought up COVID. And, and Krishna, while we're talking to you, what how has COVID changed the cannabis market? Well, for one, it, you know, it, it's because cannabis has been an essential service in, <clears throat> in nearly every market that we operate in. Mm -hmm. It's been fantastic for... Um, uh, for the financial statements of, of a lot of our companies. The sad part of it is that, you know, in the beginning, most companies had to reevaluate um, their plans for this year and make adjustments to, um, to extend their runways. And, um, and in order to do so, a lot of people lost their jobs. Um, so that, you know, that's been the unfortunate part of, uh, of, coronavirus across all industries, I think, is is the loss of jobs. Um, and I, I don't know when we're going to be able to recover as an economy as a result of that. But sure. on a company specific level, um, I think that uh, for, for us, at least a lot of a lot of the companies that we've invested in that had no, um, you know, were, that weren't planning on being profitable until next year or 2022. Uh, have all of a sudden become profitable this year. And that's a combination of an uptick in volume and uh, an increase in demand, as well as, um, as well as a, uh, you know, cutting down costs sure. and, and uh, extending that runway. Yeah, absolutely. I, I went shopping a couple weeks ago for a, a new vaporizer and turns out you can't really find them right now. They're, they're very hard to find. So it, yeah. it, it seems so, that well, that, that's a supply chain that that's likely a supply chain issue. Um, you know, a lot of vapes are manufactured in China. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, as a result of both coronavirus and also as a result of, uh, you know, of, of uh, trade regulations that have been put in place against China, 
um, it's it, it's been it, it has been difficult to uh, to get product over as quickly as as it had been in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I, I will point out, I talked to five or six vape companies, and they've all all indicated nearly double digit growth um, uh, on demand. Okay, so you're, you're indicating that it's a, a demand thing. Got it. Yep. Well, I mean, it's definitely both. But I I want to cut in here with a completely different question. Robin asked a really neat question in the questions here. And we can go around around the room. Um, Diversity in cannabis. How can a person of color get involved in in the cannabis industry? I'll open that up to the floor. Uh, Heather, let's start with you. Uh, This topic drives me absolutely insane um, because I wish... I've been, you know, talking to folks about kind of what I want to do next in terms of next steps and like the chronic problems that, or the chronic issues that have upset me in the industry for the last five years is underrepresentation of women and diversity on cap tables. So yeah. for instance, the last uh, raise that I did was a $37 million private placement. I think there was $150,000 raised from women. And that (laughs) made me so bad. Um, So I think that this issue is also the same for social equity applicants. And I think that the systemic issue around um, federal illegalization makes the capital markets game so much harder. And so a lot of these, I mean, I think it's awesome that so many companies are approaching their series B, but I think that there have been many, many founders that could not get out of the gates because they didn't belong to the country club and they weren't able to turn to their five friends to raise their seed capital. And I would love, love, love to see states that have legalized um, look at their state run pensions and the and potentially doing almost like municipal bond issuances to actually support social equity applicants. So I think that there should be in states that have been legalizing, there should be capital formation going into those groups to support them because it's a high growth sector. We've seen that it's essential. And if somebody is going to benefit, um, the fact that, you know, teachers in New York state, for instance, or other people where there's public money in a state that has Mm -hmm. publicly legalized. Um, I would love for those groups to be able to endorse social equity. So I would like to help find or form capital pools that would support um, diversity and social equity. And I would also really, really, really like to see um, people that haven't, maybe people that have been consumers, for instance, women, um, to actually start investing. So, you know, right now you can actually play a lot of the U.S. MSOs in the public space. And if you look at, and this is just my opinion, I could be dead wrong, but if you look at the way the Canadian stock market ran up, people have an interest in the space. And so there was ease in access to the capital markets in Canada. I think that you'll have a tremendous number of investors getting into the space when legalization occurs. And if you're a private investor and you could put together a basket of U.S. MSOs right now, there's probably some good value to pick up. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I would invest. It's, I mean, that's like the easiest way. You don't have to do a huge amount of investment, but I would invest. And then I don't know. I mean, I I would like to actually become, if if there's people doing organized work on this issue, like I would actually like to to help out because I think this is a really, really frustrating issue. Yeah, so what, what advice would you give to founders when they're just starting out? How should they hire or how should they approach this? Uh, I don't know. I had, I worked with, a, I've worked with a number of founders and I frankly got so fatigued with the capital raising that then I ended up going to work with the people that had the most capital as a way of, um, you know, not having <laughs> to, to work on this. Cause it's a really like raising money is really, really hard. Um, and I don't know, I would ask Emily because I feel like I remember when I first started in the industry, she and Morgan, like they've been at the fundraising game for a really long time and have been like, you know, really successful. So I would actually love to hear what Emily has to say about this. Yeah, me too. Yeah, uh, sure. Thanks. Um, I, I appreciate the perception that we've been successful. Fundraising has not been easy in cannabis. <laughs> and especially as a female, I will say as a female who was, I mean, I under, I feel like I have a lot of empathy for fundraising because I've been a female sitting across the table. Um, I do realize that, you know, 
it's just really difficult and it's difficult in cannabis um, amongst other things. But this, this issue is incredibly important. I know, you know, as a female who holds board seats, one of the things I try to do is, is make sure that I'm kind of calling this out in our hiring practices in the company. So there's, I, I would think about this two ways. There's the founder piece and then there's hiring practices. And so as a person who's interested in seeing diversity in the organizations, it's important to really kind of be the voice that's kind of being the squeaky wheel. Like, how are we doing on this? And how are we doing this on on this in our upper level management position? So that's one of the things that I think is really important as a board member and as an active investor in the company is showing up. You know, when we invested in Meadow, Meadow is a very inclusive team. And I think that that's one of the things we really liked about Hua is that he really thought about how he was constructing a, diver a diverse team in many aspects, because I think that that's where you see a lot of success too. Um, so sure. this industry really does have to be about inclusion because it is shifting a lot. Um, I will say that it depends in terms of companies launching. It is a difficult to give a broad stroke answer about how to attract capital because of a couple of things. For example, Krishnan's fund, um, as he mentioned, they invest only in ancillary companies. So if we're talking about equity applicants, it's like that's not even for retail or operating companies that touch the plant. That's not even uh, um, an investment that his firm can look at. Our firm also has limitations because we're focused on certain stages of company, like we're focused on Series A or later stage companies. So they're already up and running. If they're touching the plant, they're doing tens to hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue annually already. So it's a little bit of a different, it's not early stage launching into the plant touching piece. So there's difficulties when your funds, because it, maybe you do want to invest into early equity applicants, but it just doesn't fit your fund mandate where it is right now. I do think that in the future, those are strategies we'd like to launch, but this was the strategy that we launched because we noticed it was a gap in the funding ecosystem in our industry at the time that we put the strategy together. I personally do invest my own capital into female founders and in a diverse range of them as well. So that's something that I try to lean in on personally because it is important to me to support female founders and diversity in the founders that I select in the, that female founder base. And so I've I'd say that's one thing. And then I also think the other thing is that looking at some of these operations like the initiative or Canopy Boulder that are looking at earlier stage founders, again, some of those have limitations about plant touching, but maybe we need to see accelerators that are focused on these plant touching operators who are interested in getting into the equity applicant process and have accelerators focused entirely on that, because that could be a really great way to create not just a capital source, but a community and access point. Because I think as Heather pointed out, and I know I'm kind of running long on this, it's not just capital, it's access to continue to build a network. And that's one of the things I think that Heather and I and other women in the industry have tried to do is like, the, the male escalator is very fast and strong to, ele to elevate uh, male founders. And that's all about networking. And so I try to just use my network. And I've been very fortunate to have created male advocates and allies to help kind of my escalator path as well. And so I try to kind of pass the baton on that as well. And I think Heather and I both have worked on creating a network and continuing to foster that kind of growth, especially on the female founder side. Well, it's well said. I, I like how you ended with what you're, what you're currently doing. So Krishna, let, let's go back to you on this. What what are you currently doing to help increase diversity in in, in the cannabis space? Well, uh, I wish we were doing more, um, quite frankly. And uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, aside from having an affinity uh, to invest in companies that are um, that are female founded or minority owned in other respects um it, it is um it's about you know the extent of what we're doing today um you mm -hmm. know that said you know as as we get as you know once we get on a cap table and get active with uh you know helping a company grow um we're you know constantly encouraging that they have uh, you know particularly you know, female presence, I think that's one of the biggest issues is, uh, is more than diversity is uh, from a, from a race standpoint is, is, you know, there's not enough female board members of companies. Sure. And, and so, you know, that's something that we are constantly encouraging um, our founders to, 
to um, to look at if they're not already doing so. And um, and I think you know it's it's all about you know how how do you message it and and it depends on the CEO and, and the management team. But you know I think that um, a, a uh, you know from a from a capitalistic standpoint, um, I think that. Uh, you know, I think that institutional investors are, are looking for diversity and, and um, there are, and more and more we're starting to see that uh, there's ESG criteria that, you know, have to be met um, in order for companies to, to be able to raise significantly from large institutional investors. Um, and I think making companies aware of that early um, is, uh, is important. We need to do a lot more of that, um, but you know I think a huge part of it is is uh, you know just like anything you know just like these issues are prevalent in um, you know throughout our society is is really trying to figure out you know how how do we put women how do we put people of color in uh, in a position to where they can you know uh, th they are being considered for these roles that they are you know, that they do feel the mm -hmm. confidence to go out and, and start, you know, businesses and, uh, and, um, and monetize their, their good ideas. Um, so so know, what, what advice would you give an underrepresented, underrepresented founder in this space? How do you get above the fray? <laughs> it's, it, I, I don't, I don't think I could really give a, 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 generic piece of advice i think it's it's everything's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis but first and foremost um is well i think that is i think that is the good advice right there that there is not a one-size-fits-all solution and so the case-by-case -case basis what what are you looking for specifically well i mean we're looking for specifically um a management team that has a track record of success and the and that we're convinced has the ability to execute on the plans that you know they've laid out so mm -hmm. um it's it's all about qualifications yeah great well let's go with you can i go can i throw one more oh can i throw one oh, more yeah. just platform out there for if, if a founder is looking um so i've sure. seen so we worked on republic which is also a crowdfunding um platform but they do do private placement work as well and republic's mission is to diversify access to capital and to back uh diverse founders. So that is a platform that's set up intentionally to focus on these types of founders. They haven't necessarily been as comfortable with plant touching, but I know that a number of cannabis companies have used Republic. So I have, um, I'm happy to connect people to Republic if, uh, if, if they want a connection there. Well, that's great. We, we have 10 minutes left. Um, Di, let's go to you. What, what are you doing right now to helping increase diversity in the cannabis market? Yeah, so, so I'm actually really happy about our management team. Um, if you look at sort of our top seven, um, we actually have four women, um, so four out of seven. Um, it's only myself, our VP of operations and our CEO who are men, um, but the leadership position at our company is actually mostly uh, women uh, and from very like strong backgrounds as well. So I would say what I'm doing personally first and then what we're doing that I'm hoping we do more of. Um, so personally, you know, I, I work with a, a couple of folks who are women who sit on boards today of cannabis companies or maybe hemp companies who might consider cannabis. So just kind of keeping that bench pretty deep so that I think, you know, once we are in a position where we are adding more to our board, we currently have three today and it's basically our two major investors and our CEO. Um, so when we add a fourth and a fifth spot, we are ready with, with that bench for additional two women on, on the board. Um, mm -hmm. And then working with, you know, a couple of folks um, who were on the social equity side that I met uh, to actually and I kind of put this in the chat to actually like run real partnerships. A, a lot of these like social equity partnerships today are all economics is taken by that major, you know, MSO or, or whatever other partner. Um, so an owner might look like 51% owner, um, the cash flow never really gets to them to be a real owner. So they're paid some fee just to be on the application. So working on finding more of those people and, and then flowing to left coast ventures, how we can partner with them, because I think, you know, today we don't have retail or delivery, but there are a lot of, a lot of these licenses, especially here in Los Angeles, that are social equity applicants that we want to work with and we want to make real legitimate partnerships where they are 
real economic holders in that entity, that dispensary or delivery license, and also have equity in Left Coast Ventures. Um, so that's that's what I hope we do more of, and I've been kind of pounding the table since I've been here for the past year to have these real legitimate partnerships. Oh, great. Well, let's round out this this uh, this panel on fundraising with some advice on fundraising. So, Di, let's start with you. What what a general advice do you get to startups raising in the cannabis market? Yeah. So, you know, in this industry, unlike tech, there's not just a crunch base. There's not a tech crunch you go to where you can just find all the investors, hit them up on LinkedIn. Their emails are available. They're available on Twitter. It's a little harder. So I would say, you know, definitely leverage LinkedIn. I think investors in the space are decently, um, you know, on the platform. And, and the other thing that I would advocate for more is just finding one advocate. So whether that's a friend, a mentor, or someone who believes in whatever you're building or your product, and that person being the ecosystem, having them connect you to other people in their network, um, that's mm -hmm. probably the quickest way to level up your fundraising efforts. What what mistakes do you see right now in, in the cannabis market with, fund, with uh, fundraising? Um, on the founder CEO side, I'd say sometimes it's just a, a mistargeting, right? If, if you just go to the website, you'll see, you know, like an Arcadian may not be plant touching. So funny enough, uh, right. when I Chris's partner, uh, I got a request to connect a plant touching company with, with Matt the other day. And I'm like, well, they're not touching the plant. So kind of, I'm not sure why you're asking for this connection. Maybe they are. And, and I don't know that, but I think just, you know, doing the, the diligence work and figuring out who the right investors are and, and spending time on the ones that will invest rather than the ones that might or today just don't invest in what you're building. Yeah, great, great advice. Heather, let's go with you to the same question. Uh, what problems are, are there in fundraising that I'm seeing? Oh, well, general advice, general advice that you can give uh, startups that are looking to, to raise funds right now. Um, well, so I, I totally agree with the point with the point on finding an advocate. I think that um, the most powerful thing in your ability to raise capital is finding a good lead. And so mm -hmm. to the extent that you have somebody that is trusted by other investors, that helps uh, my, by miles. So if you have people that are on your cap table that don't want to be disclosed or are not willing to kind of advocate for you, that's, um, that, that will set you back versus people that will participate and actually support you. Um, sure. One of the things I've been working at um, doing is actually, so I, I, this is so small and micro, but like I have a book club and now I actually share my book club. I, I share any startup that I see with my book club and I'm trying to get my female friends to start investing. And I've been seeing people talk about like, stop having baby showers and have startup showers. And I think mm -hmm. it is about really, really selling your story to friends and family and seeing if you have buy-in from friends and family. And then using that very, you know, that network that you have, that's really comfortable to see if anybody in that network is connected to a deeper pocket. Cause sometimes if you don't ask, you can't get, and you just have to ask. And as a startup, you have to be willing to ask relentlessly and shamelessly right. until you find the person that actually, <laughs> oh, somebody's asking for a link to my book club. <laughs> I have to protect them. Um, but like right now oh, we're looking a at a, we're looking at a fashion startup right now. Um, like something that's totally not cannabis related. So, um, but so I think it's like micro things, like actually thinking of yourself as an investor and then using your network and talking until you find that 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 deeper pocket. And then um, I don't know, I feel like there are some like pretty big investors in the space now. And I think if you can reach out to them so that you figure out where to target, that can be helpful as well, because you don't want to be pinging the wrong groups of uh, investors. It's, it's just not a good use of your time. So I think sure. if there's a way for you to get connected to um, maybe people on this panel or otherwise that can help you get pointed to a good potential lead, that might be helpful. Um, I don't that's know. You have to be relentless and ruthless and you just have to be shameless. I think that's like the Right, you're right, right. Exactly. Now, I love the idea about the book club, but can we agree that there's no startup gender reveal party? Those might not go well. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, great. Let's go back to Emily. Emily, what, what advice do you give startups raising money right now? No, I mean, I think the advice that's been giving, given is tremendous. Um, I, I'll just say this, like I've been help, I've been working with Amanda Ryman, who I think many of us know, she's been a long 
long policy advocate in the industry and she's launching, she has a new company she's just launched. And one of the things I think she did that was really smart was she did, she enlisted a group of advisors around her from a range of different areas that she wanted to focus on. And, and I was one of the groups helping her out on the fundraising piece. And one of the things she was really smart about, and it's, it is, it's kind of like that efficient, it's like Andy Grove, you know, high output management efficiency right. in your process. And she created this spreadsheet um, going through all, by the way, she went through, I, I hope she doesn't mind that I share this. She like looked at my LinkedIn contacts to see if there were interesting people to, that we could talk about reaching out to. And what we did was we prioritized the outreach schedule so, because there are different um, priorities that different investors or strategies that different investors have. And so what she did was she prioritized her outreach to match the stage of where she's going to be so that she knows. And, and in the interim, though, she is starting to reach out to those groups that she wants for the next possible round of financing to, again, like as I was talking about, warm them up and get sure. them into the process. It's all about getting to know the people when you're placing an investment because you have to tr have trust in a team, especially at the early stage, because otherwise a pro forma financial model is is a wonderful thing to kind of dream about how it could look but we all know that there's a big delta between what happens now and what that pro forma looks like in actuality and the the way that that delta is closed and the way that that pro forma is hit is all about the team that you're investing in and so part of fundraising is just really showing investors who you are as a founder and why you're the team to believe in especially at the early stages you should send it with team. And that, that is something that we see a lot at TechCrunch. A lot of times people will introduce a product and the product's interesting, but the team, nowhere do they mention the team and investors invest in people, right? That's right. Yeah. Right. So, so right. how do you position your team to, to look great? You might know how to sell a product, but how do you sell your team? The way I think about it is always showing that you are thinking around the corners that exist in this industry. Um, look, in cannabis, there's product market fit. We don't have to worry. People want to consume cannabis. They've always wanted to consume cannabis. They've broken laws to consume cannabis. So it's established. People want cannabis. And there's actually a running joke because the Canadian, just a quick sidebar, the Canadian licensed producers managed to lose so much money over the last few years. And someone was like, how did people figure out how to start losing money selling cannabis? Like what, right. what happened? But the reality is it's all about the regulatory things and maybe people getting over their skis. But where I'm going with this is that for us, like it's a given. We believe in cannabis. We believe it's a high growth industry. It's up to the team team to execute on that. And I loved what uh, Di was talking about earlier. And some of the people we really like working with are people from a mix of backgrounds, people who come from legacy of being in the industry. So they understand just how challenging and, and how many nuances there are to operating in cannabis. Because you can't just say, I was in wine and spirits, I'm doing this now. Um, or I was in tech, I'm doing this now. You have to be able to pull in experience from what it's like to work in a heavily regulated and often irrational market such as cannabis. Um, so I like to see teams that have a mix of backgrounds um, with founders. We're always looking for a certain level of confidence, but also a level of humility because it's the humility is where the lessons are learned and the adaptability comes. When I see too much hubris, it's a huge red flag for us. And, you know, you only have to learn that lesson once um, in terms of seeing hubris uh, block the potential to save or to grow a startup. And so I think that, um, we look for certain personality traits that demonstrate the founders are going to be adaptable and willing to learn, but also strong enough in the belief around the way that their business functions that they won't just um, lose focus and kind of drift. So we are looking for certain personality traits. So it's about acumen, it's about a mix of acumen, and it's about personality as well, especially at the early stage to know that they're going to be able to get through this. Oh, and then the key thing, of course, is the motivation. Like, why are they in this space? Because sure. if it's, it, I mean, that's one of, in, in anything that's an emerging market, there's a lot of froth and hype and activity. And if someone's in here just to get rich quick, they won't make it. And chances are your invested capital will do very poorly. So you have to really think about someone who's looking to build a business for the long term and do it for the right reasons. And it's kind of that Steve Jobs notion of if you build something that's truly great, the consumers will buy it and you will be a success. Well, that, that was fundraising 101 right there. That was great. Well, thank you so much. Hey, Krishna, you're going to have the last word here. What advice do you give to startups raising money right now? Yeah, I, you know, there's been a lot of great points made here. Um, you know, Heather mentioned that having a strong anchor investor uh, is critically important. And, you know, that really speaks to uh, 
the reality that, um, you know, in the investor community, there is somewhat of a herd mentality. Um, and, uh, and having a strong anchor investor um, can, um, you know, can allow the, the uh, um, you know, the block, you know, the mental blockage of a lot of investors to whether or not they look at a deal, you know, to, to give it consideration. Um, so, you know, having someone that, you know, can, um, you can either say that, hey, that they're going to be able to support us with continued capital or, you know, look, look at the work they've done already in, in the space and uh, they're, they're clearly investing in winners and they're investing in us now. Or, um, or it's, you know, they are, uh, you know, they're in, you know, they're investors from outside the cannabis industry sure. that, uh, you know, that are, have given recognition to our business um, because it stands out uh, and, and they see how, it, they see corollaries between, you know, the, what they typically invest in and what we as a company are building out today. Uh, you know, I think, um, one other point on that is that I think um, you, you sometimes may need to think a little bit outside the box, which includes, um, you know, perhaps it's not a true anchor investor, but you're bringing in a strategic investor um, with a key trade partner, um, uh, whether it's a customer or vendor, and and having that as validation that you know your a trade partner has um, skin in the game, they believe in what you do. Um, and it's, and they're saying that it's, you know, it, it, they see it being part of their success story as well. Um, I think mm -hmm. will help uh, also get investors kind of uh, off their hands and, and interested in, in pursuing the investment when, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, piggybacking off, of, I hate that word, but I just said it, um, what Emily <laughs> just said, um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of the teams, um, teams is, 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 has always been, you know, one of the most important um, aspects of, uh, you know, that we look at when we're evaluating an investment is their ability to execute. But, you know, kind of honing in on um, what are the challenges that we as a company are going to face um, to achieve our goals to, you know, whether it's we're addressing a pain point or, you know, we're trying to um, take advantage of a business, you know, an opportunity in the marketplace. Um, so what are the laying out what the challenges are and, you know, why the team is, is specifically uh, and call out by team member, why they're able, what, why the company is well positioned to be able to address those challenges. Cause you know, I think that we're, you know, companies tend to want to focus on um, you know, why they think they're going to be mm -hmm. successful, but uh, you know, avoid conversation of what are the roadblocks um, to achieve right. that success and how are they going to be able to address that, um, right. uh, you know, uh, proactively. Uh, that's great advice. Transparency is key. And I think we're almost out. Of, we're, we are out of time. We're a couple minutes over. Um, but I will say one thing um, from a journal, journalist point of view, the advocate part about reaching out, that's so important. If you're trying to reach out to, to journalists, I have 400,000 unread emails. Um, but if an investor emails me or somebody I know, I'm going to open that email. But for everyone here, if you do want to get a hold of me, I'm just Matt, M-A-T-T -T, at TechCrunch.com. And if you put Meadow in the subject line, I'll, I'll at least open it. No promises that I'll, I'll respond, but I'll try. But I, I do appreciate everybody talking today. This is amazing advice. I'm going to go back and watch this panel one more time and see if I can put up an article on TechCrunch about it because there's just so much good advice given here today. So thank you so much for your time. And again, my email is matt at techcrunch.com. Thank you so much. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Thanks, Matt. Thank Thanks you. everybody. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Heather, Krishna, Dai, Matt. We really appreciate you all being here. And actually, if you all want to drop in the chat links, you know, where people can find you, whether it's LinkedIn, your website, uh, that'll help us all stay in touch. Um, we appreciate you being here. And we're going to keep rolling on to our next panel. Looks like.